I'm Christy Max Williams, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the concluding show of the spring season of this, the 21st year of the Arts Cafe Mystic. Thank you. Oh, thank you. For those of you somehow new to the Arts Cafe, our mission is to present the nation's most celebrated poets, along with New England's best musicians, in programs that lift your spirits, even as they deepen your mind. And if we have a little fun along the way, so much the better. Now, I might normally use this moment to report to you that the month of May is named for one of the many, many Roman fertility goddesses. I could also invoke Shakespeare's May, I might even have to remind you that it was Chaucer who deemed it the lusty month of May. But I would like instead tonight to share with you a little story. Five years ago, when Mark Doty last read at this podium, I had just announced to that night's audience that it would be the Arts Cafe's final program. At the time, which was the early throes of the Great Recession, the Arts Cafe was partnering with the town of Groton, which was providing a third of our funding. We had been informed that the town's funding would not continue. At the time, the region's foundations had also notified us that they would no longer provide grants. They were hard times. The Arts Cafe was dead in the water, my friends. Following that announcement that evening of our imminent demise, Mark Doty, who had just won the National Book Award for Poetry, stood here and asserted to that night's audience that the Arts Cafe should not end, that a way should be found to sustain it. In the wake of Mr. Doty's remarks, members of our audience came together, formed a board, and began a process of reconstituting the Arts Cafe as its own independent nonprofit org, funded by your generosity. The Arts Cafe is alive and well, and we owe Mark Doty a great debt of thanks. So, on with our show. Our opening voice tonight is the Connecticut-based poet Lana Orfanides, who is also a longtime friend of the Arts Cafe. Ms. Orfanides has previously published a chapbook called Sea and Sound of Wind, and she collaborated on a book of poetry and paintings called Spring, Rebirth, and Renewal. But we catch Ms. Orfanides tonight after the recent publication of her first full-length book of poems called Searching for Angels, which has been hailed as an exquisitely wrought collection and has earned a Pushcart Prize nomination. Here are poems of a sort one doesn't hear very often, celebratory, gracious, warm, with a richness of language and vision that instructs us how to live life, to love nature, by deeply attending on the world. Here are frank poems of love, sung in a clear, bell-like voice. Here are earthy poems of birth, death, and loss. These poems invite us to pay attention to, as the poet says, what gives the heart ease. Well. We could, all of us, our hearts that is, use a little ease. So won't you please join me in welcoming Lana Orfanides. Thank you so much, Christy. It's such a pleasure to be here. and Thank you for that great introduction. It's always so much fun to read here. This is such a 
fabulous group of people who come, and you know that people come because they want to hear poetry. I recently read at a fashion show. It, it wasn't quite as much fun. <laughs> I'd like to start off uh, with a poem that has inspired me because so many of my poems deal with nature and the, the solace of nature. This is by Wendell Berry, The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. It's just a beautiful poem, I think. I'm also very excited to be reading with Mark Doty. What a wonderful honor that is. Someone who is so brave and funny and brilliant and it's wonderful to have this opportunity. So you have a lot to look forward to, plus a wonderful musical group, too. This is a poem about meeting my husband, or not really meeting him. The Seeds Within. You walked across the grass at twilight, and the curve of the earth changed. The strength of your stride, the force of your gaze beguiled me. The world from which you came, unknown. The world that I had known, gone. The seeds of our lives were in that moment that we met. The seeds of our children and their children, hidden deep within, like sleeping seraphim. You walked across the grass at twilight, and I, on the opposite side, saw the curve of the earth shift. In the angle of that light, we traced a triangle to meet, as if we knew the way, as if all was known, and all that was to be began. This book is somewhat chronologically organized, so I'm going to read something that would follow that poem. Green. I remember the grass, green in the darkness, and underneath the giving ground. The lilt of the highway, the waiting car by the side of the road, his soft breath, the green stains on my white skirt, and the sound. It could have been horns, or it could have been us caroling in the grass. I uh, was brought up Roman Catholic, but I married into Greek Orthodox, and our service was a Greek Orthodox service. And in that service, you wear crowns, and you circle around the altar three times. This is a sonnet for that wedding. The vow. How brave we were to marry in the fall with darkness coming early and the cold rising from the damp leaves, the sun stalled, scattered, its wan light no longer gold. From those years of parting and receding, here we were in bright sunlight after all, still daring to go forward, offering, needing to trust in one quick act a single vow. We held tall candles, wore the wedding crowns, walked a circle as if to cast a spell, tethered by a ribbon three times round, tethered by the light, the sound of bells, the rings, the kiss, the flowers in my hair, and suddenly gardenias filled the singing air. Heartbeats. 
This morning, I looked at the two empty chairs facing each other under the canopy of rain. Imagine the mail coming with his name. Tonight, I count his heartbeats. The light from the white alarm clock shines in the darkness, its green numbers marking the seconds. I touch the soft silk of his thigh, throw my arm around his broad, strong back, and press my chest to listen, but I lose count. Outside, the clouds gather in the Florida heat. The air conditioner sounds like rain. Each time it starts, he jumps in sleep like one walking unknown terrain. His feet dance in intervals like skipping rocks or as if he is crossing a swaying bridge. In my dreams, we are fording a bright river. We are light and laughing and no one is counting. Sometimes when I'm surrounded by my family and it's a beautiful day and everybody seems happy, like things have actually all gone our way, I'm overcome. Summer afternoon. And this I have to uh, dedicate to my friend Rhonda because we really wrote this. She was my inspiration for this. She read me something that, from Luke and the Bible. And that's where this comes from. Summer afternoon. Sometimes the heart is pressed down to overflowing, trampled in joy and afraid, so shaken by love it is hard to breathe. Your hair mine for Debbie. Marie Howe said, this is not part of the poem, Marie Howe, who was one of my favorite poets, said, uh, poetry holds this knowledge that we are both living and dying at the same time. I think that's a wonderful quote. And poetry can do a lot more than many people realize. Your hair mine for Debbie. The day after your death, I cut my hair unaware of the tradition of ancient mourners, but thinking somehow to honor you, begin anew, or become someone who had not been there when you died, looking just as you did before, only surprised by death's swiftness against such a warrior. But I am changed, as if passed through a sieve, each molecule, crust of skin, shard of bone, altered. I would weave wisps of your hair into mine, take your kindness and your strength, carry them into battle, and fly like the great gray hawk who visited me unexpected this morning as I sat among your things, listening to the earth and the sweet grass sing. This book is dedicated to my mother, who was a great support to me when I was about 14. I won this poetry award, and she wrote it out in um, calligraphy. Calligraphy, that's the word. And did a little painting around the outside, and then framed it and hung it up in our hallway. That was very wonderful. But she was very amazing in many ways. But she always wanted to travel, but she was afraid to fly. So one trip to Greece, I took her in spirit with me, going in. Lavender and the soft haze of sage, pale green capers and wild thyme lined the path to the sea. Below us, the beach was a small, empty crescent far from the town, the moonscape of mountains behind. The weather was windy, and this our first swim in the still cold Aegean. I invited my mother, dead then eight years, for the dip. I asked if she'd like to dive with me, warm me, sustain me, make me look brave. 
She smiled, almost laughed, and gladly came diving. Weightless all spirit, her long swimmer's body joined mine. Motion and essence, we arched like a dolphin, a sound wave of coming and going. In that moment, as light rolled into darkness, ocean spilled into ocean, I was liquid and flowing, I was past and present, future and never. I was water and space and the taste of salt. I was gone and come back unafraid. A little levity for a minute here. Probably only have a minute here. Her other name, when I was in Italy with some friends, I decided that I should have an Italian name. Lana Orfanides wasn't good enough. I, I mean, I was Lana Palmer, can you imagine? But anyway, I chose the name Gabriella. I thought that was a beautiful name. And then we were going to Orvieto, so I thought, well, I will be Gabriella Orvieto. What could be better? When she was Gabriella, or Vieto, she soared and flew. Her eyes were bright and clear. She knew each glance, the way to trick the fear. What looks would kill, what words say no. The girl had no regrets, each road was new. She never looked back, she never told all. She dressed in silver, her hair was shining, her walk was languid, and when she strolled the streets, bicyclists fell from their seats. <laughs> Nothing could offend her, no comment slow her down, no friend would deny her, no boundary could confine her. And when she read her poems of longing, they jumped into the soul and each word sang. Each languid phrase became a siren song. The audience was thrilled and all afire, for she was Gabriella Orvieto, and all she had was all that she desired. <laughs> In the Greek Orthodox Church, on the 40th day after death, a memorial service is said for the soul. I was brought up Catholic, but I am married to a Greek. My father was very strict Catholic. My father's breath. It is 40 days since your death. A hemisphere away, I find the Monastery of Miracles, St. Raphael and Nicholas. It is dusk, an amber sky. We park the car quickly, and I run up the cobblestones to the door, locked too late to light a candle, send you safely on, as if I, your fallen angel, have the power, as if you, stark Catholic in heaven already, would care about the 40 days the candle lit. Across the way is the church of the monastery, the church of Magdalene. The door is open. A dark figure of a woman stands just inside. She is chanting, but it is the sound of evening birds, melodic, joyful, no death dirge. She will chant for hours, incense of myrrh surrounding her. No place to kneel, no chairs. I stand before the icon of Magdalene, dark with age and sorrow tears pulsing behind my eyes, and light my candle, just as a breeze blows a kiss across the flame. Amen. I think I'll just do um, one more. This is, I have no spring poems, I realized. I'm very sorry about that. I'm going to have to remedy that. But this is the hope of spring. Winter solstice. So you'll have to imagine that it's winter and reindeers are around and you know, all that kind of stuff. Winter solstice. This is no ordinary time. Reindeer climb the skies, fires light the hillsides, and the bear comes in. The air is sharp 
and the sky is more transparent now. Prayers travel easily through it. From where we are, we can see the universe just beginning. From where we are, new islands are appearing. The bare trees are sterling and gold. In the shining cold, we hide under the covers as though spring will never return. But watch how the earth tilts toward the sun, swinging in its spinning blue space. Watch how the light chases the darkness. The lilting stars expand and slide into morning. Gather the winter colors around, spin them into magical white. Lean into the earth and bend with it. The dark sky will open. Thank you very much. Lana Orfanides, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Lana. That was lovely. I'm pleased to announce that we have Lana's Searching for Angels on sale tonight. As always, all proceeds go to the author. This gives me a chance to thank our friends at Bank Square Books for their support. Mystic is lucky to have so hip and friendly an independent bookstore. I also want to take a moment to thank the Mystic Arts Center for welcoming the Arts Cafe again. Our community is fortunate to have such a resource and we are grateful to feel at home here. So, on with our show. Tonight's musical interlude is served up by the J. Hunter Group, which performs that most wonderful of musical conversations, jazz. If you get out much at night in these parts, you have encountered these musicians in various combinations and venues, I'm sure, which in part is what makes the jazz conversation mm, so interesting. The good players know the topics to be discussed, that is, the standard tunes that you all know and love. But like all conversations, theirs is an improvisation. But I wonder if you realize how accomplished these players are. Did you know that the band leader Jim Hunter is also a longtime member of the string section of the Eastern Connecticut Symphony? Did you know that Wesleyan trained pianist Rufus Davis is the music director at St. John's? Did you know that the drummer Alvin Carter fronts two of his own ensembles, Legacy Keepers of Tradition and the Alvin Carter Project? And did you know that the wonderful saxophone player Steve Marion has performed and recorded with a multitude of the best bands in New England, including Razzmatazz, Sugar Daddy, The Hornets, and Total Eclipse? My friends, these are some of the region's finest musicians, and we are fortunate tonight for the opportunity to eavesdrop on their musical conversation. So won't you please give a warm welcome to the J. Hunter Group.
You guys having a good time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We are the Jay Hunter Group. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jay Hunter Group. And there is uh, on drums tonight is my good friend Alvin Carter. Keyboards is my good friend Rufus Davis. Oh, you can have a good friend, more than one good friend. Yeah. <laughs> my good friend Rufus Davis. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Marion is the saxophone player. Yes. Oh. Here is a, a thing. My mem band members are speaking uh, when they should not be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was saving my good friend for the last thing. I was going to say, the saxophone player is Stephen Marion, and I was going to say, my good friend! <laughs> <laughs> and I am, and I am the uh, J, and the J Hunter group, I'm James Hunter. Oh! Yeah. The first song we played was J Mac by the real Kenny G, Keith Garrett. And the second song we played, the second song we was, was by Idris Ibrahim called Water, Water from the Ancient Water from Well. Ancient well. <laughs> and the song we just last played was by McCoy Tiny called Island Birdie. And we are going to end right now with a song called Bud's Bubble, which is also Crazeology, in case you heard crazeology and you hear the same tune, it's because it's just bug, it's bubble possible. Okay, rhythm changes, anybody? Rhythm changes in B flat, rhythm changes in B flat. Right, and I will be, check my marble.
Um, with your indulgence, at this season-ending show, we'd like to tender some thank yous. First, I'm always glad for the opportunity to thank members of the Arts Cafe's board, who include Bill Grady, Wendy Halsey, Patty Kitchings, Susan Moffat, Fia Moore, Ben Philbrick, Liz Raisbeck, Paul Ann Sheets, and John Sutherland. These good folks deserve your gratitude for donating their time and talent. <clears throat> and as always, my thanks, my fond thanks to our volunteers, to our sound engineer, Christopher Greenleaf, our videographer, Jim Marshall, to Thea Moore at the book table, Cody Williams and Christine Grady at her concessions table, and to my own Kate, who was everywhere in my life. <laughs> it's their dedication that makes this show go. I'm also pleased to thank our sponsors, the Chester Kitchings Foundation, Bank Square Books, and the Whalers Inn. Finally, I want to pay particular homage to those of you who have made generous donations to our programs. Please know that your investment in the, the Arts Cafe makes the absolute difference in sustaining this series, and we thank you. If there's anyone left who hasn't been thanked, I'll see you in the bar after the show and I'll buy. I've been looking forward to this moment. Mark Doty is the sort of poet whose reputation is so immense that he needs no introduction, so please forgive me if I indulge myself. Mark Doty is widely regarded as among our nation's greatest living poets. That's my opinion, but it is the opinion of many who think about such things. He's certainly one of our most honored poets. His previous book, Fire to Fire, won the National Book Award for Poetry. He's also won the National Book Critics Award, the National Poetry Series Prize, the Bingham Poetry Prize, and the Lambda Literary Award, among others. Mr. Doty is the only American poet to have received Britain's T.S. Eliot Prize. In addition, he has earned acclaim for his four books of nonfiction, including the best-selling Dog Years and Still Life with Oysters and Lemon, the best book I've read on art. A Mark Doty poem is a sort of moment's document in the life of an intelligent heart. These moments are conveyed in a clear, unadorned, first-person voice a voice that feels devoid of poetic tricks, a trustworthy voice whose honesty is meant not to shock, but instead to reflect a process of learning and realization through observation and experience. It's the voice we might want and use to document our own heart's story. And Mr. Doty trusts in and depends on the power of stories to convey the heart's experience. Many of this poet's best poems are worked out in long sentences whose sinewy syntax make them feel like thought, feel like feeling itself. The paradox of a Mark Doty poem is that on first reading it seems uncrafted, but with each additional reading, it reveals its craft as a subtle but accurate instrument for collecting and organizing observed detail, the kind of detail that makes music of ordinary life. Indeed, Mr. Doty also trusts in and depends on life's details as the structure on which he founds the epiphanies that are at the heart of his poems. Mr. Doty, just published Deep Lane, his eighth book of poems, which confirms his place on the pantheon of great poets all over again and underscores 
why his poetry has been favorably compared with that of Whitman, Lorca, Keats, and Cavafy. My friends, it is good luck to have the opportunity to introduce this poet to you. It is even better luck to be hear him read his poems. So won't you please join me in welcoming Mark Doty. very pleased to be here and I of course you know when somebody says thing stuff like that about you <laughs> what can you say uh, it is wonderful to be welcomed to the stage by Christy and I'm actually even more grateful to Christy for making me feel extremely effective <laughs> you know? um, the Mystic Arts Cafe is is kaput and I say you need the Mystic Arts Cafe and look what happens so I wanted to suggest that you consider sending me to the House of Representatives, perhaps? <laughs> no? um, Texas, perhaps? <laughs> um, I also, uh, it's a delight to read with Lana, I much appreciated, and those musicians, which were extraordinary, craft and energy. <laughs> now, that music, um, is, we might say, not a part of the pastoral tradition, right? <laughs> that is as urban as you can get. Um, and, you know, you do not walk down some quiet country lane when a saxophone begins to blow somewhere, right? Those instruments have to do with the energy and hustle and clash of urban life. And that makes me want to begin with a poem, um, which is a, a, a poem set in New York City, in part, I made friends with a young poet who got a job at the Museum of Modern Art. And what was great about this for me was that it meant that I could get in on Tuesdays when they're closed. <laughs> and there, uh, I always admired Jackson Pollock. I, I thought, well, interesting paintings. I don't think I quite get them. And then I got to be alone with them in a large room with them. And it was a very different experience to be alone with Jackson Pollock. He painted. Uh, at the, much of his best work, out at the end of the South Fork of Long Island. Uh, his barn studio is still standing, you can go there, you can feel the kind of simmering energy of all that happened in that space. He, outside the barn is Akabonic Harbor, beautiful salt marsh. My house in the country is about a mile from there, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Pollock, uh, what else do I want to say about him? I guess that may be all you need to know. Okay. <laughs> Let's set the stage for these things. So, um, as you hear this poem, you can import a little of that music hmm? along the way, if you like. To so Jackson Pollock. Last night, somebody murdered a young tree on 7th Avenue between 18th and 19th. Only two in that block. And just days ago, we'd taken refreshment in the crisp and particular shade of that young ginkgo's tight leaves, its beauty and optimism. Though I didn't think of that word until the snapped trunk this morning, a broken broomstick discarded, and tell me, what pleasure could you take from that? Maybe I understand it, the sudden surge of rage and the requirement of a gesture, but this hour I place myself firmly on the side of thirst, the sapling's ambition to draw from the secret streams beneath this city to lift up our subterranean waters. Power in a pointless scrawl now on the pavement. Pollock, when he swung his wild arcs in the barn air by Akabonic, stripped away incident and detail till all that was left was swing and fall and return, austere rhythm, deep down things, beautiful, because he subtracted the specific stub and pith, this wreck on the too hot pavement where scavengers spread their secondhand books in the scalding sunlight. Or maybe he didn't. Erase it, I mean. Look into the fierce ellipse of his preserved gestures, and hasn't he swept up every bit, all the busted and incomplete, half-finished and lost? Alone in the grand rooms of last century's heroic painters, granted entrance on an off day to a museum with nobody, thank you, this once, nobody talking, for the first time I understood his huge canvases were prayers, no matter to what, and silent as hell. 
He wrote the huge engine of his attention towards silence, and silence emanated from them, and they would not take no for an answer, though there is no other. Forget supplication, beseechment, praise. Look down into it, the smash-up swirl, oil and pigment and tree shatter, tumult in equilibrium. Oh, thank you. So that, that swooping pattern in the smash trunk, in the pollock canvas, in the music we just heard, I imagine if you could stand far enough away from the world, that's what you would say, hmm? beginnings and endings, creation and destruction. This new book, you can see, this has been out for a month. See what National Poetry Month has done to me? You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> an external representation of my soul at this point. Um, <laughs> This book is called Deep Lane because uh, about a mile from that Pollock's barn is, is my little house out there, and a mile from my house is a road called Deep Lane. It's a beautiful little country road, but what I really like about it is the name. The two monosyllables, the long vowels, Deep Lane, the sense of it being pulled forward and down. And for the last seven years, I've spent as much time there as I can, and gradually that name began to somehow acquire a resonance to pull more meanings onto itself. And I wrote a poem called Deep Lane, and when I finished it, I knew there was more. And in a while, I wrote another one. And eventually I wrote nine poems called Deep Lane. And um, I recommend this to poets. You don't have to come up with a new title every time. <laughs> um, this poem, uh, this Deep Lane poem, has to do with the work of the gardener. And as that painting suggests cycles of creation and destruction, so time in the garden means watching what emerges, watches what passes, watching what passes. The poem also remembers the late Deborah Diggs, a marvelous poet who left us about four years ago now. Deep Lane. When I'm down on my knees, pulling up wild mustard by the roots before it sets seed, hauling the old ferns further into the shade, I'm talking to the anvil of darkness. Break table. Slab, no blow could dent, rung with the making, and out of that chop and rot comes the fresh surf of the lupins. When the shovel slips into white root flesh, into the meat coursing with cool water, when I'm grubbing on my knees, what is the hammer? Dusky skin of the tuber, naked worms who write on the soil every letter, my companion blind, all day we go digging, harrowing, rooting deep, spade plunge and trowel, Sweet turned down gas flame, slow charring carbon, out of which sprouts the wild unsayable. Beauty's the least of it. You get ready, like Deborah, who used to garden in the dark, hauling out candles and a tall glass of what she said was tea, <laughs> and digging and reading and studying in the dirt. She'd bring a dictionary. If study is prayer, she said, I'm praying. If you've already gone down to the anvil, if you've rested your face on that adamant, maybe you're already changed. I, you know, when you order anything from a garden catalog, you know you immediately receive 150 more garden catalogs. <laughs> and when this happened to me, uh, one showed up was a, a catalog of bearded iris, which are the most outrageously hybridized flowers. And there's this bearded iris called Anvil of Darkness. <laughs> I thought I probably wouldn't order that. <laughs> so I went to write, the, I thought I was going to write a little comic poem about that flower, and you see what happened. In this Deep Lane um, poem, you will encounter my dog Ned, uh, a golden retriever who is a fine example of his kind. Deep Lane, June 23rd, evening of the first fireflies. We're walking in the cemetery down the road, and I look up from my distracted study of whatever, an unfocused gaze somewhere a few feet in front of my shoes, and see that Ned has run on ahead, with the champagne plume of his tail held especially high, his head erect, which is often a sign that he has something he believes he is not allowed to have. <laughs> and in the gathering twilight, what is it that is gathered? Who is doing the harvesting? I can make out that the long horizontal between his lovely jaws is one of the four stakes planted on the slope to indicate where a backhoe will dig a new grave. 
course, my impulse is to run after him, to replace the marker, out of respect for the rule that we won't desecrate the tombs, or at least for those who knew the woman whose name inks a placard in the rectangle claimed by the four poles of vanishing, three poles now, <laughs> and how it's within their recollection, their gathering, she'll live. Evening of memory, spark lamps in the grass. I stand and watch him go, and it's wild figure eights. I say, you run, darling. You tear up that hill. <laughs> of course, he needs no encouragement from me. <laughs> In um, Song of Myself, which is perhaps the great American poem, if, if we need to have such a thing, um, or such a category, uh, Whitman very early on tells us exactly one story, which, which is this. He, 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 the speaker in the poem, is outside somewhere, and he has a sexual encounter, he claims, with his soul. And, um, <laughs> and then, from the bliss of this experience, arises a sense of peace and joy and tenderness towards experience. In it, he, he looks at the world and he says, the kelson of the creation is love. The kelson is that long wooden beam that, in a wooden ship, you know, the whole, the whole thing together. And this joy is so great that it spills into everything. He says, even down into heaped stones and elder, mullen and pokeweed. I've stolen that line for this poem to a diff very different end. Deep Lane. We began to think the white fish individual, the one of the pair who'd struggled, after all, when our pond's cold or water shocked, and he lay pulsing in the shallows till we thought him all but gone then simply drew himself up, if that were something a fish could do, and swam away. A heron ate his mate. He surfaced in March, after his first season entombed in the bottom mud, unscathed, a four-inch emperor in his white silk coat. Insignia of the kingdom splashed over his back the color of candied orange rind. He'd nose up out of the lily murk when our shadows crossed his borders, pushed to the edge to open the translucent white ring of his mouth over and over, as if begging, as if seems to want, seems to feel. But as we knew him, semblance fell away. We felt the presence of the soul of him, if soul could be understood as specificity. So that when he himself was swallowed, white appetite perched on the roof, bill raised to the air, the throat unrelenting, the absence in the pond grew resonant, a sort of empty ringing. Where were the details then, the gestures that had marked him? Heapstones and elder, mullen and pokeweed. How can I take any pleasure in this garden? So, um, that wonderful Wendell Berry poem about you know, the, the piece of wild things with the herons in it. That heron has no forethought of his own mortality because he's thinking about the mortality of my fish. You know, he's, he's planning to do. Okay. Manichaeanism. Uh, the theology test. Okay. Anybody recall Manichaeanism? Yeah. Margaret, go for it. No, you're not going to do it? Okay. This is the, this is the heresy, according to the, the Catholic Church, uh, that the world is equally divided between the forces of good and evil, darkness and light, and that the outcome of that struggle is not yet known. Mm -hmm. Deep lane. Into Eden came the ticks. <laughs> Princes of this world. Heat-seeking, tiny, multitudinous. Lord, why have you given them a heart, a nervous system, a lit microchip of a brain, is it, if not to invite Manichaeanism? <laughs> Hard to believe. The force that shaped the mild tortoise traversing the undergrowth with smallest steps, the sway-necked lily, hard to countenance that same mind dotting paradise with pinhead demons wanting nothing but to gorge, to suck beyond the dreams of their hell brothers, the mosquitoes, <laughs> implacable, without boundary, pure appetite. I wouldn't know anything about that. Fire Island, uh, it's an extraordinary, geographically, and, and uh, sort of in terms of natural life, an extraordinary place. It's a 20 mile long barrier island on the south coast of Long Island. Robert Moses once famously wanted to put a highway right down the middle of it. 
and stop, thank God, by homeowners there. There are no motor vehicles on Fire Island except for you know, utility trucks. You get around on boardwalks or on the sand. And the result of that is that the wildlife is unusually visible and present. Um, two of the communities on Fire Island, the Pines and Cherry Grove, are historically gay and lesbian resorts. This poem takes place in the Pines. Um, I think the one thing that might not be familiar here is the word gnomon, which is on a sundial, you know, the part that casts a shadow and tells you what time it is, is the gnomon. The king of Fire Island. Oh, one more thing. Every summer, it's a huge thing called the Pines Party, and this is, if you love the beach, this is a shocking thing. Out come the bulldozers, they flatten out the sand, they build a dance floor on the beach, put up some big speakers, and there's a party. Which is... <laughs> What would Mary Oliver say? <laughs> You've got me doing my stand-up thing. <laughs> okay. All right, this is called The King of Fire Island. Hard by our fence in tea dance light, he seemed the very model of his kind, a buck in velvet at the garden rim. Bronze lightly shagged, split thumbs of antlers budding, that odd way deer hold extra still, as though there were degrees of stasis. We were objects of his regal, mild regard. Did I really say tea? Measure the afternoon by a bar event? Here it's a fixed point, no man of the day. Our island scattered men gather near seven and stand with cocktails in the thick of buzzing bodies intent in quick talk, though their subtle eyes won't miss a trick. Here, after all, tea dance started. Wise strategy for an island with no street lamps, boardwalks pitching along the dunes, scary after drinks, far better navigated before nightfall. He stepped toward us, an unexpected lurch, and then we saw. One front leg merely tapered to a whisper, like the torso of a cartoon ghost. No hoof. He gladly accepted a carrot, a gesture plainly familiar. Where else could he have lived? No cars, no hunting, visitors who'd bring him kitchen scraps, nothing to trouble but cameras buzzing their automatic flash, or dance music booming from some big box rental. And ticks. He wore a small crown of swollen passengers between his two brave ears where he could not bite them, and no other deer provided the seemingly secret grooming they perform. He exhaled a small puff of carrot-scented wind, handsome face expressive, not much in doubt of the human. We'd see him evenings up the walk, browsing the cranberry bog. He hauled himself through gardens, intently working tufts of grass, muscle shoulder pulling him ahead. A hoof's a deft accomplishment, that hard sheen shoe of blue-black carbon, but he'd learned to do with what he had. I brought him celery. He liked corn silk, but not the husks, and seemed to prefer the leaves of sassafras with their faint spice scent. Something, did I imagine it, seemed to pass across his gaze as he took them in, lower jaw working horizontally, a faint tearing sound. Then he'd take his tongue to my hands. They startled me at first those sucking lips around my fingertips, careful, as if he were grooming another of his kind. I felt I could lay my hand on that long slope of forehead or stroke behind the ears, though whatever was left of his wildness needed to stand. I tried to name him. He wanted no word from me. More likely, I should be subject to this monarch of holly, hobbling prince of Shadblow Grove, our island's crippled king. When July mounted to its zenith, his antlers turned in oddly, each mirroring the other. Wouldn't they collide? What grows in toward itself? How could it find company among its kind? I went looking, spent daylilies in hand, but if a white tail flashed, it wasn't his. Paul said, you can't will him to show up. Out there somewhere, in the leaf realms of August, lurching alone through all that glory, in the distance, the party thundered, season climbing to its apogee. Big speakers dragged out to the shore where midnight lapped the snow fence, and dreamers swayed and danced, held one another themselves. And though the artificial mist tried to complicate the twittering sky field of laser lights, a real fog put the false one to shame. In November, Paul saw him grazing a thicket of the yellowing bog. Not again. 
than late winter, a hushed, not quite scrutable rumor on the ferry, a deer's head floating in the bay, wreathed with flowers, evidence of ritual murder, Santeria, never to be mentioned again. Bad for business. Knowledge no summer renter required. My friend, have I any right to call him that? He could hardly flee. But listen, I saw my own severed head slip to the floor, a glazed, paltry thing, open eye looking up toward my subjectivity as if through a bloody gel. So much for the notion you can't die in a dream. I was the witness I've always been. Likewise beheaded. Would you allow me now to do what I would not when you were living and take in my hands those twin branches sturdy as oars? Can't I take hold of you in the water, in the dark, floating in the gift of flowers, not lurching, steady, easy? Now guide me out of the story, spirit. I don't know where it is you lead, but I believe. You must have been weary of that form, as I grow weary of my head and leave it behind, cast off thing, and lend my body to your severed crown. So I'll read you a little poem, a very different sort of animal encounter. Um, the poem takes its title from uh, a town south of San Francisco it's called Pescadero. The little goats like my mouth and fingers. And one stands up against the wire fence and taps on the fence board a hoof made blacker by the dirt of the field, pushes her mouth forward to my mouth so that I can see the smallish squared seeds of her teeth and the bristle whiskers, and then she kisses me, though I know it doesn't mean kiss. <laughs> then leans her head way back, arcing her spine, goat yoga, all pleasure and greeting, and then good-natured indifference. She loves me. She likes me a lot. She takes interest in me. She doesn't know me at all, or need to, having thus acknowledged me, though I am all happiness, since I have been welcomed by the field's small envoy, and the splayed hoof, fragrant with soil, has rested on the fence board beside my hand. So, um, I did not know until quite recently that the United Nations has chosen you know, one day each year, which is called World Happiness Day. And in, uh, I, I can't, of course I can't tell you what it is, uh, but it, they have published a poetry anthology for World Happiness Day and that poem is included, which is, is thrilling to me. An amazing thing. Okay. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and read you one poem, which is not in this book. Um, and it's a poem that I didn't know I could write. I didn't know if this was possible to write. I was outraged and profoundly moved by um, the death of a young man named Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio. He was murdered uh, by the police uh, in November of this last year. Uh, he was 12 years old. He was playing with a plastic gun in a town park. The poem is... Um, called, uh, well, I'll put it this way, the title of the poem, in two seconds, is also the first half of the first line. In two seconds, Tamir Rice, 2002 to 2014. In two seconds, the boy's face climbed back down the 12-year tunnel of its becoming, a charcoal sunflower swallowing itself. Who has eyes to see or ears to hear? If you could see what happens fastest, unmaking the human irreplaceable, a star falling into complete gravitational darkness from all points of itself, all this, the held, loved body into which entered milk and music, honeying the cells of him, who sang to him, stroked the nap of the scalp, kissed the flesh knot after the cord completed its work of fueling into him the long history of those whose suffering was made more bearable by the as yet unknown of him, playing alone in some unthinkable future city, a Cleveland, whatever that might be. Two seconds to elapse, the arc of joy in the conception bed, the labor of hands repeated until the hands no longer required attention, so that as the woman folded, her hopes for him sank into the fabric of his shirts and underpants, 
down they go, swirling down into the maw of a greater dark. Treasure box, comic books, pocket knife, bell from a lost cat's collar, why even begin to enumerate them when behind every tributary poured into him comes rushing backward all he hasn't been yet? Everything that boy could have thought or made, sung or theorized, built on the quavering but continuous structure that had preceded him, sank into an absence in the shape of a boy playing with a plastic gun in a city park in Ohio in the middle of the afternoon. When I say two seconds, I don't mean the time it took him to die. I mean the lapse between the instant the cruiser lurched to a halt on the grass, between that moment and the one in which the officer fired his weapon. The two seconds taken to assess the situation. I believe it is part of the work of poetry to try at least the moment and skin of another, but for this hour, I respectfully decline. I refuse it. May that officer be visited every night of his life by an enormity collapsing in front of him into an incomprehensible bloom and the voice that howls out of it. If this is no poem, then... But that voice, erased boy, beloved of time, who did nothing to no one and became nothing because of it, I know that voice is one of the things we call poetry. It isn't only to his killer he's speaking. Two poems to go, okay? Can you handle two poems? Yeah. Okay. This one, uh, we'll go back to New York City for a moment. Uh, and this is a poem that has to do with the value, at least begins, as a meditation on the value and power of habit. You know, habit gets a bad rep. We think that habit limits our perceptions. It, it uh, keeps us from seeing the world freshly. But, you know, if you know what kind of muffin you like, that's kind of freeing, right? You don't have to make a choice, although you can use your mental energy for other things. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Okay. Uh, and for reasons which will become clear, this is called This Your Home Now. For years, I went to the Peruvian barbers on 18th Street. Comforting, welcome. The full coat rack, three chairs held by three barbers, the eldest by the window, the middle one a slight fellow who spoke an oddly feminine Spanish, the youngest last, red-haired, self-consciously masculine, and in each of the mirrors, their children's photos, mildly smutty cartoons, postcards from Machu Picchu. I was happy in any chair, though I liked best the touch of the eldest who'd rest his hand against my neck in a thoughtless, confident way. 10 years, maybe. One day, the powdery blue steel shutters pulled down over the window and door, not to be raised again. They'd lost their lease. I didn't know how at a loss I'd feel. This haze around what I'd like to think the sculptural presence of my skull requires neither art nor science. But two haircuts on 7th, one in Dublin, nothing right. Then I hear my friend Marie laughing over my shoulder saying, in your poems, there's always a then. And I think, is it a poem without a then? Dull early winter, back on 18th, up spiraling red in a cylinder of glass, and just below the line of sidewalk, a new sign, Willie's Barbershop. Dark hallway, glass door, and there's presumably Willie. When I tell him I used to go down the street, he says in an inscrutable accent, this your home now. Puts me in a chair, asks me what I want, and soon he's clipping and singing with the radio's Latin dance tune. That's when I notice Willie's walls, though he's been here all the week, spangled with images hung in barbershops since the beginning of time. Lounge singers, near celebrities, random boxers, Italian boys, Puerto Rican, caught in the hour of their beauty, though they'd scowl at the word. Victors cheering over a trophy, one for what? Frames already dusty at slight angles. Here, it's clear forever. Are barbershops like aspens, each sprung from a common root 10,000 years old? <laughs> Sons of one father, flashing fighters and starlets to shield the tenderness of their hearts. Our guardian, Willie, defies time, his chair our ferry boat. And we go down in the trance of touch and the skull buzz drone, singing cranial nerves in the direction of peace. And so I understand that in the back of this nothing building on 18th Street, I've found that door ajar before, in daylight, when it shouldn't be. Some forgotten bulb left burning in a fathomless shaft of my uncharted nights. 
The men I have outlived await their turns, the fevered and wasted whose mothers and lovers scattered their ashes and gave away their clothes. Twenty years, and their names tumble into a numb well. Though I have, not, I have not forgotten one of you, may I never forget one of you, these layers of men arrayed in their no longer breathing ranks. Willie, I have not lived well in my grief for them. I have lugged this weight from place to place as though it were mine to account for. And today I sit in your good chair in the sixth decade of my life. And if your back door is a threshold of the kingdom of the lost, yours is a steady hand on my shoulder. Go down into the still waters of this chair and come up refreshed, ready to face the avenue. Maybe I do believe we will not be left comfortless. After everything comes tumbling down, or you tear it down, and stumble in the shadow valley trenches of the moon, there's still a decent chance at a barbershop, salsa on the radio, the instruments of renewal wielded effortlessly, and who'd have thought, for you, Willie, if he is Willie, fusses much longer over my head than my head merits, which allows me to be grateful without qualification. Could I be a little satisfied? There's a man who loves me, our dogs, 15, 20 more good years, if I'm a bit careful. It's what I haven't written. It's sunny out, though cold. After I tip Willie, I'm going down to Jane Street, to a coffee shop I like, and then I'm going to write this poem. Then... Willie, there really is a Willie. He's become my friend. Um, and it's the other day, I, actually a little longer than that, I got my hair cut, and uh, I opened my wallet. I forgot to go to the bank. There's nothing in it. And, and Willie said, oh, you okay? He said, don't pay, don't pay, don't pay. <laughs> Lovely man. And then the next time I go there, Willie's like really glowing. And I said, Willie, you've been out in the sun. You have a good weekend? He said, I have a little drink. <laughs> So this is the last poem, and for it, um, it would be useful to, for you to think about hydrangeas, those marvelous garden flowers, which, um, you know, they're beautiful when they first bloom, but the colors just get better. They age, they, they model, they splotch. Spent. Late August morning, I go out to cut spent and faded hydrangeas, washed greens, russets, troubled little auras of sky, as if these were the very silks of Versailles modeled by rain and ruin, then half restored after all this time. When I come back with my handful, I realize I've accidentally locked the door and can't get back into the house. The dining room window's easiest, crawl through beauty bush and spirea, push aside some errant maples, take down the wood frame screen, hoist myself up. But how exactly to clamber across the sill and the radiator down to the tile? I try bending one leg in, but I don't fold readily. I push myself up so that my waist rests against the sill and lean forward, place my hands on the floor and begin to slide down into the room, which makes me think this was what it was like to be born. <laughs> Awkward. Too big for the passageway. Negotiate. Submit. When I give myself to gravity, there I am, inside, no harm, the dazzling splotchy flower head scattered around me on the floor. Will leaving the world be the same? Uncertainty as to how to proceed, some discomfort, and suddenly you're where? I am so involved with this idea, I forget to unlock the door. <laughs> so when I go to fetch the mail, I'm locked out again. <laughs> am I at home in this house? Would I prefer to be out here where I could be almost anyone? This time, it's simpler. The window frame, the radiator, my descent. Born twice in one day. In their silver jug, these bruised, blessed flowers, how hard I had to work to bring them into this room. When I say spent, I don't mean they have no further coin. If there are lives to come, I think they might be a little easier than this one. Mark Doty, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you, Mark. Thanks also to the J. Hunter Group and Lana Orfanides. For those of you who would like to take a little Mark Doty home with you, you can take instead a couple of his books, including Fire to Fire, which won the National Book Award, his greatest hits, really, and or uh, Deep Lane, which he would be glad to sign for you. The Arts Cafe will return in September. Have a good summer. And remember, the Arts Cafe is a tribute to you. This is community, my friends. And doesn't it feel good? Good night.